What's up, everybody, and welcome to the Week 8 edition of the Falcons Final Whistle Podcast. I'm Scott Baer alongside Tori McElhaney and Ashton Edmonds following a weird, wild, crazy, pick your colorful adjective and insert it before you get to a 37-34 to overtime victory for the Falcons. That was a strange one. Uh, nonetheless, the Falcons emerge from this game at 4-4. Four and four. They are now sitting alone, one game ahead atop the NFC South as we hit the pivot point in the 2022 season. There is so much to unpack. I'm betting that if you're listening to this podcast, you probably watched the game, and I bet that you would agree, what the heck? bruv <laughs> as i'm reading directly from tori mcelandy's notes what the heck bruv so <laughs> i'm just heck, gonna i normally say what are your takeaways tori what the heck bruv i know <laughs> what the heck bruv i truly this was ugh, wild wacky chaotic you know all of the adjectives it was at times it was hard to watch at other times it was exciting to watch uh, it was it was what it was it wasn't pretty it wasn't great it was what it was and I think that's perfectly fine I mean in turn at, at the end of the day they did get the win um but I will say something that I kind of took from this game was there's a lot to clean up and there's a lot like to me this game didn't have to go all the way to the the end the way it did. I thought the Falcons had ample amounts of opportunities to win this game in regulation. However, that didn't happen. So what do you do? You try and win in overtime. And I really, the best quote of the night for me was I was talking to Jake Matthews in the locker room and I kind of said, you know, it wasn't a pretty game, but you still won. How do you kind of weigh that in your head? And he said, look, this is what Arthur Smith talks about. It doesn't matter what it looks like. The goal is to win no matter what it takes. However, we got to score, whether it's defense, offense, special teams, we all got to work together to find ways to win. Sometimes it's not always the prettiest, but this was a great team win. And I think that can be true. All of these things I think can be true. And that was something that I wrote about post game. It's like all of these things can be true. The Falcons can and should play better, but they still won. And there should be happy feelings about winning. I really think that win probability charts, uh, it's, a, it's a dumb thing to track. I think it doesn't tell you a whole lot about a game. The final score does. But go take a look at the win probability graphic for Falcons Panthers. There was a point, there was a point where the Falcons had a 99.2% chance of winning the game. Mm -hmm. And then there was another point where the Panthers had a 95 percent chance of winning the game and then you see that graph drop straight off a cliff mm -hmm. down the other way and the Falcons emerge um Ashton uh Arthur Smith actually said you all probably had to delete some stories right <laughs> yeah oh yeah Ashton, no doubt yeah you and I talked about a sidebar idea on the quote-unquote game winning drive for sure which which ended with uh Marcus Mariota to Demir Bird. Yep. Mm -hmm. That was not the game-winning drive. It was As not. As a matter of fact, quite a few things happened after <laughs> that. You, you literally told me to just scrap it. Like I'm like, <laughs> just, just, just start over. So <laughs> from the point that you had to scrap that story, what did you make of everything else that happened? Man, it was it was truly a roller coaster of, of a win, I would say. Um, but I, I think the Falcons never gave up. They stayed resilient. Um the Panthers definitely had a couple chances to win this game. I, I don't think we've ever seen anything like this at all. You know, a kicker missing two back-to-back game-winning field goals. Uh, I just, you know, we were all on the edge of our seats. We were all thinking, like, okay, what's going on? You know, the Falcons probably were like, you know, the game was probably over. But I think in that second drive in overtime, you know, Mark, I feel like Marcus knew that he had to make a play in. You know, when he exploded for 30 yards up the left side to put the Falcons in field goal range, I think that showed um, just his maturity and that showed his growth and that showed his confidence in himself. And, you know, I think that's why the Falcons came out with the win. I was talking to Rashawn Evans after the game. Well, not just me. There was a group of people there. Mm -hmm. We don't have to say to me or anything right. like that. Um, there was a group of people there. And um, somebody asked him, were you able to watch – that 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 overtime field goal attempt by by Eddie Pinheiro of the uh, of the pa Panthers that was ultimately no good, 
and he said that he acted like he wasn't watching, and he turned around his face away from the field, but he found a screen inside of the luxury suites at the field level <laughs> and watched it. So he was acting like he, he, he wasn't watching, but he couldn't help himself. He found a screen and watched it, and he said that, he, it, that it was just one of those elation moments that they will have another chance. And we've talked a lot about this team, and Jake Matthews referenced it as well. Talk a lot about this team being fighters, guys who don't quit. And there are there are a lot of opportunities for them to have been like, well, that's it. We finally blew it. Our win probabilities at <laughs> – the Panthers' win probabilities <laughs> at 95%. <laughs> that's over. But they still kept going. They made mistakes. It was definitely not pretty, exactly right. what Tori said. But they found a way to win here. And they, that's how they're going to have to do it sometimes. Yeah. It's not always going to be pretty. They don't have uh, a pristine roster full of playmakers and depth and all these other things that luxuries that some other teams have. So when it comes down to the end and you make a mistake, you got to keep pushing, and that's what they did here. It's funny because Arthur Smith said after the game, his direct quote it was, it broke our way, and sometimes you need that to happen. Yeah. I mean, that's – so true. I mean, when you take we you you can take this game for what it was, and no one's excusing that the offense should have started off faster and started off hotter. No one's excuse excusing the many third and long explosives that this defense gave up. No one is excusing so many, so many. Yeah. No one is excusing that Carolina gave the Falcons every chance, every opportunity <laughs> to go and win this game. And yeah, they did win, but it, it came down to a break. It came down to a breakthrough. And at the end of the day, like, you take all of that for what it is. And you move forward because you have to. And I think when I look at this game, yes, there's so much to fix. And I know some people were like, Tori, you're being super hard on this team for, like, they came out and they played well and they're fighters and they're resilient. It's like, yes, they are. We know this about them. We also know that they are now competitive. And I feel like this team is a team that, when it comes down to it, is going to get people talking in many different ways. And I'm, and it's because of that that I feel like there is potential here. I feel like there is potential in what Arthur Smith and this coaching staff is doing with this team in 2022 that is pieced together with guys on one-year contracts that are teeny tiny contracts in the grand scheme of contracts in the NFL, <laughs> plus a lot of rookies and a lot of guys on their rookie contract and on their rookie deal. Because of all of that, I feel like, yeah, sometimes you need a break. And this was their break. Yeah, it absolutely was. And everything went back and forth. We've talked about how the Panthers kicker missed two, two field goal or two and, and, an, an extra, extra point. point that would have won it, and then a field goal that would have won it in overtime. Yeah. Um, Arthur Smith didn't even wait until fourth down to call on Young Waku. Yeah, he didn't. And from forty-one out, game on the line. With as weird as that game was, another miss would have just fallen. Oh Lord! Into the you know, absolutely the insane abyss. play by play, but he, it was a no doubter. Young way stuck yeah. it. And Ashton, you wrote about young way yep. after this game. What did his kind of coaches and teammates have to say about a guy who's, this is his, his fourth game winner. Yes. Yep. His fourth and game winner. His career. Yep. And he just stuck it. The guy's got nerves of steel. Yeah, for sure. I mean, every, I would say every coach, every player in the locker room had faith in young way to make that field goal for sure. What was going through his head, and I'm quoting Young Way. He said, I caught myself saying to myself, you never know. At the end of the day, you got to be ready. There's no excuse to be like, oh, I thought it was over, so I wasn't prepared. Nobody cares. You just got to stay ready. It's not over until the whistles are blown. So just stay ready, locked in, and be ready to go. And I think we all know that Young Way is, is a very calm and cool – he has that calm and cool demeanor. And we saw that displayed on the field, you know, in, in those last – in that last two-minute stretch in overtime. And, um, you know, he just wasn't phased, and he made the game when a field goal – and I, I even had faith in Youngway that he was going to make it. I mean, he was efficient the whole game through all four quarters. He made three uh, – three, he went three for three on field goals and four for four on extra kicks today. So, um, you know, I think Youngway came up big when it mattered most. Here's the thing about Youngway, and I, I love Youngway's story and people who have followed the Falcons for years now know Youngway's story. It's written on the back of their hand probably, and he's become a fan favorite for what he's been able to do, and I think part of that is because of his story – but you talk about feeling confident in what Young Way Koo is able to do. And that was something that came up a, a multitude of times in post-game press conferences and in open locker room. It's like when you're in a game 
where the opposing kicker misses not one, but two kicks that would have sealed the win, that would have given that team the win. The value of Young Waiku, I feel like, should not be overlooked because of that in a game where you saw what happens when you don't have a kicker that can go out and win you the game. Now, I'm not saying that it's just the kicker and all that kind of stuff, but (laughs) we've seen, because of the way the NFL is right now, we're seeing games being won on kicks left and right. We are seeing games being won by one possession in the final minutes of the game. This one just happened to go to overtime. So because of that, I feel like with Young Waiku, you cannot overlook how important he is to this overall operation. I think it was even, it was Marcus Mariota said after the game, something along the lines of like, I think Young Waiku is good for our team, obviously, but he's also good for the sport. That was like a fantastic quote. From Marcus, I think he said, like, also good for the league or something like that. I'm yeah, yeah he's, he said, um, I can't explain how valuable he is, not only to this team, but to really to football, right? Yeah, li- I, yeah, I loved that quote from Marcus, and I think it does kind of showcase, I don't know, yeah, how important <laughs> Young, Young Waiku Wai- is yeah. in multiple facets of not just the Falcons game, but I think what Marcus was saying, the league at large. And, okay, so... This game ended in a celebration, Young Wei Koo throwing his helmet into the air, uh, <laughs> heads up, and, <laughs> and uh, being hoisted on his teammates' shoulders. And a win is a win is a win, right? right? But this is the Falcons' final whistle. And we look at things in three dimensions. Yeah. And it wouldn't be prudent of us to ignore some things that we've brought up a couple times, some glaring issues mm-hmm. that need to be fixed. Is it better to make a fix with a win instead of a loss every player will tell you that it's always easier on a Monday after you win 100 (laughs) percent but this was a flawed game yep um it still counts as a W but this is a flawed game and if the goal is to stay atop the NFC South you better get right in certain areas to worry what were your biggest issues not issues with how they played, right. but what were some things that you think need to get cleaned up? Yeah, first off is I feel like the Falcons have to start better offensively. Yeah, like right. they just have to. I I can't. I don't. I'm not looking at the the play breakdown right now, right in front of me. But I feel like there were just way too many. Not even three and outs, but you're getting like really quick drives where you are having to give the ball back to Carolina without any type of points at all. Um, that first off, like that, because I did feel like we got well into the second. They had 33 yards in the first quarter. Yeah, ex- thank you. <laughs> Case in point, um, I feel like the first drive that I actually felt like was one that I was kind of pleased, even pleased with. I think was well into the second quarter yeah, perhaps there's a 10 play 74 yard yep. touchdown yes. drive where yeah. they looked really good that was the one that was the one drive of I think the first half that I was like okay there they are there there's the there they go but for me I just think this offense for it to be at its best they have to start quicker they just do and and I I asked uh, or we asked uh, Marcus Mariota about that post game too and he said he took the blame um, in that first half, he said, I've got to be better. That slow start, I wasn't executing. I've got to be better. I've got to be cleaner. And I, I appreciate that by Marcus, but I do think it's the overall scope of the offense as a whole, too. The overall scope of the offense has to be better as a unit in the first and second quarter. And I, I feel like that's been kind of a, a – not an issue – well, kind of an issue over the last few games, too. I feel like we can point to other moments in the first and second quarter where this team was not executing at the clip it needed to. Now, that's the offense. I have to give some two cents on the defense. This defense was giving up way too many explosive plays on third and long and second and long, even sometimes third and medium. And that, to me, is not who this defense is. We saw last week how against the Bengals – the explosive plays that this defense gave up. That felt like it kind of carried over into this game, and that's not something that this defense is known for. That's not something this defense, I feel like, has been ha, – it's not something that this defense, I think, has been known for over the course of the last two years under Dean Pease. And I, I feel like Dean Pease has even said that as well. So – that needs to be cleaned up, making sure that they are getting off the field on third and long situations. And then, of course, like finally just taking advantage of opportunities that opposing teams give them. 
Um, I think that was something that we saw in the Bengals game when the Falcons get the ball coming out of halftime and they go three and out, they have a defensive stop, and then they go three and out again. And it's like that sandwich together was the one moment that they had to really make something happen in that game, and it didn't happen. I feel like there were moments in this game where the Falcons should have, could have, would have won in regulation had they executed in those moments where Carolina is not performing at the clip that they need to. So I just went on a very long rant. <laughs> uh-huh. But we're here for it. Everybody was taking notes. Uh, right. right. Yeah, I hope so. If not, there, there's a quiz at the end of this. So <laughs> you're out of luck if you aren't. <laughs> yeah. I, you don't want to make injuries an excuse for anything, and the coaches don't. But you also have to look at a plain reality. The ideal secondary for the Falcons is A.J. Terrell, Casey Hayward, Isaiah Oliver, Jalen Hawkins, and Richie Grant. Mm-hmm. Against Carolina – And I made a bunch of fun of P.J. Walker. Not fun of him, but I pointed out the discrepancy between his performance and Joe Burrow's. Yeah. Nonetheless, um, this secondary was Isaiah Oliver, Richie Grant, Dean Marlowe, Cornell Armstrong, Mm -hmm. and Darren Hall. Mm -hmm. No disrespect to anyone that I just mentioned, but there is a – there is a significant difference between the ideal version of the secondary and what was available to the Falcons today. They overcame. Arthur Smith made a made a real point to say, to praise Cornell Armstrong, the fact he never quit. He kept rolling out there and he kept trying to do his best and he did make some plays. But I think that that played a factor here. And Rashawn Evans said after the game, he said, "If, if we can heal up a little bit, I think that we can take our play to the to the next level. Uh, Casey Hayward's on injured reserve. Yeah. There's no telling when he's going to be back. But I think if they can heal up, that's another one of those moments where I think this defense can get better. I think the injuries hurt them this time. And if we're going to talk about Young Way Koo, one of those kind of trusted automatic guys, yeah, he misses a field goal every now and then. A.J. Terrell is in the same category. Mm-hmm. He's, he's a guy that you trust. Deep ball to A.J. side one-on-one, he's – He's probably going to knock it down. Right. Yeah. Maybe he doesn't every time, but that's kind of what you feel. And I think that having a player like that, one of their top three players, I think it hurt them in this game. And I think that Falcons fans and the Falcons are obviously wishing him a speedy recovery. Right. Yeah. And it was interesting because Scott and I at one point turned to each other, and I'm pretty sure it was when P.J. Walker found um, – DJ Moore, it was in, I think, the beginning of the second quarter. It was a 20-yard pickup down the sideline. Cornell Armstrong was in coverage. And it, the he turned around, and the ball went through. It felt like he was just like a centimeter. Cornell was so close to making a play. A centimeter away from an interception. And instead, it's a 20-yard pickup for Walker and Moore. Scott turned, and he was like, it really feels like AJ, if if (laughs) AJ is there. Yep. If it's AJ in that situation, it's a different outcome. And I think that is fair to say. AJ has a few inches on Cornell Armstrong. I also wonder how Carolina's offensive play calling would have differed had AJ Terrell been out on the field. Like now we're getting into like, like we're getting into the weeds of this. But I do wonder because I guarantee you I haven't looked at this. I want to look at this tomorrow. I want to know how many times Cornell Armstrong was targeted over the course of this game, four quarters plus overtime. I want to know because it really felt like live that it was happening constantly. And when you have a team that is constantly going after a guy like that, I mean, it's, it's almost a respect thing. And we saw what, like we saw last year, there were quarterbacks and offensive coordinators actively choosing not to throw AJ Terrell's way. That is, that's just truth. So, because of all that, it does make you wonder. And I'm not, and this again, again this is not us saying, you know, anything. AJ like Terrell make, is a second team All Pro. Right. Yeah. Th- yeah. It's just, it, it's just us having conversations. Right. Yeah. Nonetheless, uh, you know, when you look at Marcus Mariota, right? He's the NFC. Offensive player of the week, one week. Mm-hmm. The next week, my mailbag's full of people screaming for Desmond. The, r- the Ritter <laughs> ruckus, as I like to call it. Right. And it goes back and forth. And it probably will continue to uh, because both um, camps have very passionate followers. But Ashton, you look at Marcus Mariota's day. Okay, 20 for 28, 253 yards, three touchdowns, a pick, 43 yards rushing. 
including that huge 30-yarder, right? right. Um, what did you take from Marcus Mariota's performance and his post-game press conference? Yeah, I, I think Marcus never gave up throughout the whole game. I know he threw an interception early in the first quarter, but he bounced back. He threw a, a touchdown to Kyle Pitts early in the second quarter. Um, like I, I just think Marcus, Marcus's mindset, he, he definitely has a resilient and a never-give-up mentality. And we've seen that through all four quarters. Yes, he threw a, a crucial interception in overtime that yeah. the Panthers, you know, they could have won the game from that. But, you know, the very next drive when the Falcons got the ball, he did explode for 30 yards to the Panthers' 24-yard line that set up Ku's field goal. So I think Marcus, you know, it's like he doesn't dwell on his mistakes, I would say. Um, and that maturity, you know, that comes from just experience of being in the league. And I think, you know, Marcus is, is starting to feel confident. I think he said that in this presser. He's yep. starting to feel like him like himself, and mm -hmm. he's starting to feel way more confident. And um, I think that's going to be very, very crucial moving forward into the season. Here's the thing, and I want people to hear me when I say this. <laughs> I'm getting very heated in this, in this podcast. <laughs> I apologize. But I want people to hear this. We were talking to Jake Matthews after the game. Jake Matthews was on fire. He had so many great things to he say. Was. Really appreciated it. Um, but – he was asked about Marcus, and what he said about Marcus, I think, is the reason why people calling for Desmond Ritter maybe need to take a back seat for a little bit, just a little bit. He said Marcus has the personality that you, that where you really want to do well for him just because of how well he takes care of us, his attitude, the way he comes to work every day. I couldn't be happier that he's our quarterback. This is your veteran offensive – your veteran offensive line. Captain. Captain. But this, this is the guy who, if you want to go to and get the real scoop on what the heck is going on with this offense, whatever you want to say, that's the guy you go to. Jake Matthews has been in this league. He, he's played for a lot of different Falcons teams that have been at the top and been at the bottom. For Jake Matthews to say that, for Jake Matthews to be like, this locker room has Marcus's back because of X, Y, and Z – I, I feel like everyone needs to take a heat check on that and that alone. Yeah. Like, we, we talk about, you know, oh, when are we going to see Desmond Ritter, blah, blah, blah. Like, I feel like the Ritter ruckus is always super loud in moments like this. And, and I understand it. I really do. But you have to look at what this locker room believes in Mark. They believe in Marcus. This, to me, is really important. And it's something that I feel like we haven't gotten a lot of clarity on until – you have your captain, veteran, offensive lineman saying, I couldn't be happier that Marcus Mariota is our quarterback right now. Yeah, and you have to listen to that, and you have to listen to the locker room and listen to the fact that in good moments and bad, Arthur Smith has stuck with Marcus Mariota. Yeah. And another thing is that they're in first place in the NFC South. You're going to make a quarterback change when you're – even though you're only four and four, that you're on top of the division, you want to shake things up now, or do you want to try to find the consistency that has been elusive to this point? Inconsistency with some gumption leads you to four and four. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what it does. And ultimately, as we push forward here, I wrote a whole column about this. <laughs> Go ahead and read it. Why don't you? About the fact what it kind of means to be on top of the NFC South in week nine. P.S. There are no gold stars being handed out. Um, and kind of how they can stay there. And talking to a bunch of different guys, it was all about, okay, great, we're here now. How do we stay here? Mm -hmm. How is it possible? Because, I'm sorry, Tom Brady ain't going to take three and five oh, lying no. down. <laughs> He's just not. And the, and the Dennis Allen – uh, whooped his former team, the Raiders, by a heavy margin. Mm. This division, while it's kind of become a bit of a punchline because everybody was under 500, and it's an easy uh, kind of joke that you can make on Twitter, it's not going to stay like that forever. So how do you stay there? How do you find consistency? How do you, borrow from Arthur Smith here, continue to be objective mm -hmm. and not just, hey, we won, but, man, we're lucky we won, and we if we don't fix this stuff – we're not going to keep winning. Mm -hmm. um, every time I bring up strength of schedule, Tori rolls her eyes at me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do. And, That's a true story. And so I even said it in the column, there's no such thing as an easy schedule because it's all about who you play and when you play them. Playing the Bengals in week seven, that was a rough go. Mm. Uh, nonetheless, what I'm trying to get at here is that they need to find some consistency and there are opportunities to stack wins 
as a majority. I'm not saying going on on a crazy winning streak, but okay, so you have one game of separation. As Darren Hall put it, you got to keep pushing. Mm -hmm. You got to keep working and fixing or being in first place in week nine could lead you to third place in week 18. Yeah. I mean, who gives a crap if you're in first place right now? Especially considering... It's better than being in fourth? 100%. Absolutely. But I think from overall, like, mentality, you want to be in this position, yes, but, like, I I completely agree with kind of what they're saying. It's like, you want to be in this position, it's all great, and it's all all wonderful, and sunshine, rainbows, whatever, but you have to... You have to continue producing, and you have to find consistency. I think that's the difference between this Atlanta Falcons team as they move forward is finding consistency. And I I do believe that, yes, while you can go into Monday and look back on this game and be like, okay, we have to fix X, Y, and Z because we're not going to be able to get – get away with X, Y, and Z against X, Y, and Z. You know, like there are so many variables yep. that we're talking about. However, I think that that's so important for the Falcons to find, to be able to find consistency and really be hard on themselves, really be objective. Because I like going back to what I was saying, I do think that there is potential there because of the way the NFC South is playing right now, not just right now, but the way that these teams are constructed. I think the Falcons have a good chance and a good opportunity. And like what Arthur Smith said during the week, the best way to be a playoff team is to win your division. Yeah. So go win your division. And and I I think like even with even saying all of that, like I know, Scott, you're absolutely right that the NFC South is kind of the punchline right now where everybody's talking about like, oh, the NFC South, they're not very good. Like, look at what look at what what is happening in the NFC South. But at the end of the day, Falcons win the division or if anybody wins the division. There you go. It's a home playoff. It's a yeah. home playoff. It's a yeah. birth. Like, so for all, all – I say all of that to say this. The Falcons have a lot of work to do, and I completely agree that there's no, there's no being content in where they are right now because we are one play away from them losing this game, and the narrative around where the Falcons are right now – is very, very different. So Completely flipped. Completely yep. flipped. The feelings around this team, if they were to have lost that game, I don't even want to think about it. It would have made our, our jobs a lot harder, I can tell you that for <laughs> sure. Um, but I, I, they won. So they won. You have good opportunities coming up against some of the teams that you are playing, both home and away, over the course of the next month of the season. Go out, get you some wins, because if you can win, keep winning, you can keep putting good play together. Who, who's to say that when we get to December that this isn't a much, much bigger conversation? Yeah, and they're going to be in the thick of it, and I think that's going to be fun moving forward. Um, but you all can move forward with your uh, day at this point because we're uh, wrapping up here on Falcons Final Whistle. You know the drill. Rate, review, please subscribe to the Falcons Podcast Network. That would be super awesome. You can get other quality programming like the Falcons Audible with Derek, DJ, and Dave. Or you can get Falcons in Focus where we dive deep into the personalities of the 53-man roster. Enough of that funny voice. But I did want to leave you (laughs) with a quote from Darren Hall that I think (laughs) was just pure poetry and only lasts one line. After that 37-34 to overtime win, his reaction to it, he says, and I quote, after what just happened, we must be living right. <laughs> <laughs> I like that quote. <laughs> <laughs>